Well, that didn't go to plan. In this episode of Restore It, I carry on with the BMW E30 325i Sport. This looks really, really bad. And that's because it is really, really bad. But it's also a great opportunity to start from scratch. This is exactly how the car arrived from Spain after being in limbo for about a year. I'll get into how it happened during this episode, but for now, let's take a look at what's left of the old girl. So we're missing both seals, the tail panel, and most of the rear quarter panels. When the car was originally blasted, it was coated with a bog standard primer that offered little to no protection. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but I'm sure there were some of you who were screaming at me in the comments. Well, your screams fell on death ears, and now look at it. Quite rusty. Let's empty all of these parts out and have a look inside. There is a lot of surface rust, but thankfully due to the seals and the quarter panels not being there anymore, we can get to pretty much every major part of the car, and if anything, this is now going to be a more thorough job than originally planned. It is a lot of work, so it's a bloody good job this is one of my passions. Thankfully, we still have all of the parts that have been removed, as well as some of the panels from E30 Garage Norway, two of which are now useless to us, and if you haven't already, you'll soon see why. I've still got the rotisserie, and the plan is to put the car back on it once a few things have been sorted out. You can see why the garage in Spain didn't want to repair the seals, the quarter panel or the tail panel. They were all in a terrible state. Bits like the battery tray have already been done, but will need re-blasting and protecting properly before I can do anything else. The current situation with the rear quarters is that the panels I have from E30 Garage Norway aren't full quarter panels, which is what the Spanish garage thought I had on delivery when they made the cuts. I think some of you can see where this is heading, and it's not the outcome I wanted, but things don't always go to plan, and so I have to adapt. You can see the difference from the repair panels to the ones that have been removed. There was definitely some miscommunication with the garage, but we'll get onto that soon. Not too long ago, I had to make up some dollies so I could move this chassis away from the building as it was labelled an arson risk by the fire safety people. So now, I'm going to take these dollies and use them to move the main project around. So here's the plan. I'm going to blast the entire car and remove all of the surface rust. At the same time, or on a second pass, remove all of the old primer so the chassis is completely bare metal. At that point, I can apply two wet coats of two pack epoxy primer to the entire chassis to seal the metal and prevent any further rusting. Then, I'm ready to start the real welding work. As I knew they would, my first welding episodes on this car make me cringe. And so, I'm going to completely redo every single repair I've done and some of the repairs the garage in Spain did, using the new knowledge and skills I obtained from the Mercedes and the internet since then. No more tiny patches and sections made from five separate pieces, it'll be full panels from either BMW or E30 Garage Norway, or properly fabricated pieces. Before I can even think about adding new panels, I need to face the harsh truth that this chassis needs blasting again. I did say at the time when it was first blasted that I wanted to do it, but I wasn't allowed to for whatever reason. Well, be careful what you wish for, won't you? Because now, I get to. Before we get into that, I want to quickly tell you about Blinkist, an app I use quite a lot whilst I'm making these restoration videos. Don't get me wrong, reading books is great. It's just the amount of books I want to read makes it difficult for me to get through them all in good time, what with such a busy schedule. So this is why I use, and I'm happy to recommend Blinkist. It takes the most important information from some of the best-selling books and podcasts and condenses them into 15-minute blinks and short casts that you can either read or listen to, which, as you can tell by the headphones, is the way I like to take in my blinks. Three titles that have stood out to me recently are Daniel Pink's Drive, The Expectation Effect by Daniel Robson, and Wanting by Luke Burgess, all of which focus on psychology. Daniel Pink's Drive has been especially useful in helping me understand what intrinsically motivates me within the YouTube space, and how I should move forward taking that new perspective into account. With more than 5,000 titles from 27 categories, I really do think this is one of the best apps out there for someone who's looking to learn. So if you're looking to better yourself, or learn more about a specific topic, make sure to click the link at the top of the description and receive a 7 day free trial. Plus, as a Restorer viewer, you'll get 25% off if you decide you want the premium membership. So if you'd like to support Restore It, this is one of the best ways to do so. Just download the app and check it out. And like I do, you might just love it. Big thanks to Blinkist for partnering up. Let's get back to the 325i. My first thought was to blast the chassis using this portable blaster I brought from a guy who had just finished doing the same thing. He sold me 29 bags of media and just threw the blaster in for free. I honestly don't know how he did it. It's not very powerful and you have to get quite close for it to be effective. 
I rolled out the Steely Pop Blaster, filled it up to 125 psi and gave that a go. It was looking good, but immediately stopped working. Although this was my own fault for not sieving the media well enough. Let's try that again. Well, that's about 100 times faster and definitely the one I'm going to use. This was meant to be a quick test, but I got a bit carried away as this is one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. It's good to know that this rust is superficial, and the real rust was blasted away the first time round using a much more powerful system compared to this one. I don't understand why these welds are copper coloured. Any repair that looks like this was done in Spain, and I'm not quite sure the method they went for. If you know, please do let me know down in the comments. I found that removing the primer at the same time wasn't too much of a big deal. This blaster, although hobby level, is actually quite powerful when it's close to max pressure. You just need the compressor to keep up. And thankfully, with 200 litres, I can just about do it. Well, it's a start, just a little bit more to go. This is going to be a lot of work. It's pretty slow going, but it is working. I think once the whole car looks like this, I'll go over the whole thing again to remove any trace of rust whatsoever. To keep waste to a minimum, I'm vacuuming all of the media that falls into the car and onto the ground and sieving it so it can be used again. If anyone knows where I can get these inner arches from, please do let me know. I know you can get a lip repair kit for them, but I prefer to replace the whole thing on both sides. Up to this point I've been using the pop blaster on half power. This is now at full power. Much much faster. I just think we need to do this inside something rather than half inside my workshop with the extractor on. I should probably remove this piece of plastic which might be hiding rust. To be able to blast on full power for prolonged periods of time, I'm going to do this in an enclosed space, which will trap the media and make it much easier to clean up. I found the cheapest four-sided 3x6 meter gazebo on eBay and had it set up in about 20 minutes. Now I can get down to some serious rust removal. So getting back to how I ended up in this situation, I was in Spain at the time, the car was at the local workshop and plans were being made for some rust repairs. We came to the conclusion that I should get new rear quarters, seals and a tail panel, all of which was doable thanks to E30 Garage Norway. I made the order and the guys got to work on the other parts of the car that we already had bits for, also from E30 Garage Norway. As we were waiting for the new parts to be shipped, the pandemic started and all hell broke loose. No parcels were leaving Norway and even if they were, I couldn't go to the depot and pick them up. It was just a total breakdown of everything. So the project came to a halt and I started to focus on other things to keep the content flowing. At some point, some kind of miscommunication was had with the garage and they thought I was bringing them full rear quarters. So to make progress on the car, they made all of the cuts they could safely without the panels being there. After about six months of no parts, they finally arrived and we discovered that they were completely different from what had been cut off. 
I'm going to take the blame on this one as I should have been more clear about the type of panels that were arriving. The same goes for the seals, which were also completely removed. These particular panels from E30 Garage Norway are meant to be used as very large patch panels that can be butt welded in and not straight up replacements, which is where I was going wrong. Going back to the car for a second, the blasting is working a treat, quite easily bringing it back to bare metal. Although this is a lot of work, I really am enjoying blasting every single inch of this car. It'll be nice knowing it was done thoroughly when it's all finished. Continuing on with this terrible story, I know some of you will be thinking, how the hell did this happen? I'm not too sure myself. Along with the pandemic and just moving to Spain in general and running a YouTube channel, it was all just a bit too much to handle and things clearly got out of hand. The best option I see now is to find full replacement rear quarter panels and attach them just like the garage in Spain planned to. Thankfully, the cuts are lower than all of the points a new panel would attach to, so it is possible, not easy, but frankly I'm out of other options. The only issue is the availability of said panels. These things are like antimatter, extremely hard to get hold of and eye-wateringly expensive. I had someone from BMW tell me very recently that he saw two on eBay sell for 1.5k and then a week later the person who bought them listed them separately for 2k each and they sold immediately. So this isn't looking good for me at all. The original quarter panels are ruined, especially after being removed thinking they weren't going to be needed anymore, so they can't be used. The patch panels from E30 Garage Norway are just that, patch panels, so they won't do. The only way I can see myself getting out of this is to take the quarter panels from the chassis I got for £200 that was on its way to the scrapyard. I've had a few people offer me £500 for that chassis and I was tempted to sell it as it needs pretty much every part and a lot of welding to bring it back to life. So I feel like this is just a perfect option for me at the moment. It just feels like it was meant to fall into my hands when it did, just to fix this particular problem. It's not what I wanted to do, but it's the only thing that makes sense. We'll come back to this later on in the episode. In total, it took me five half days to blast the chassis, and that's only the bits you can see from where it's sat. Once it's back on the rotisserie, I'll turn it 360 and do more blasting and priming. One thing you can't really see from this footage is all of the blasting I did inside of the car, as in inside of the 3D bits that make up the car. We're almost there now, it's starting to look a lot less depressing. It's mostly just the inside and the engine bay left. The sides are looking really good, as well as most of the boot and the parcel shelf. Once the car's on its side, I'll finish the boot off along with all of the other hard to reach bits like inside the roof.
You can see what I mean by the inner arches needing a full replacement or at least a lip kit. The more I blast, the more of my old repairs I find, and I can't help but laugh at them. It probably was a bit silly to practice on the car I'm restoring, but at least now I can go back over everything with a new mindset and hopefully a new welder. I think it's about time I got something a little bit more serious. If you lot have any suggestions, please do leave them down in the comments. Ideally, I'd like a MIG as well as a TIG for the thinner bids, but money is an object, so I'll probably just stick with the MIG. I blasted from early afternoon until sunset most days, and spent about 6 hours with the trigger pulled removing rust. The rest of the time is spent cleaning up, sieving the media, refilling the pot, removing the gazebo and securing it each time, and sorting out blockages. Lots of faffing around, definitely more faffing around than blasting. This is definitely a very rewarding thing to do though. Almost instant gratification, and it's nice knowing it's going to stay this way this time round. The only major bit left now is the right side footwell, and then just a few small areas like the sunroof and the boot side panel. With not a lot of blasting left to do, I had a mains water pipe burst right outside of my workshop and flood the front of it. I didn't get to do much blasting on this day, as I was saving my stuff from getting wet and trying to block the flow of water with bags of blasting media, which kind of worked. At this point, 99% of the bits I'm blasting on this first round are done. I just need to clean down one last time before I blast it for the final time going over the entire car to make sure all signs of rust and primer are gone. Surprisingly I didn't lose much media during this, I still seem to have as many bags as I did when I first started. And just so you don't think it's me, you can see the flow of water and all of the sand it left behind when the mains pipe burst. Thankfully it flowed around the back of the workshop and didn't flood the rear half. I did feel a bit sorry for my shop vac on this one, but it handled it surprisingly well. The only issue I had is the huge static shocks I'd get if I forgot to hold onto the car and I'd still get them off the vac if I touched it by mistake. I thought a few of them were going to induce a heart attack or something, they were that shocking. With all of the media gone, you can really see the difference. And doesn't it just feel great? Just a few more spots to go and it'll be ready for epoxy primer, which as I'm about to find out, isn't as straightforward as it sounds. Finally, on day five of blasting, all of the easily accessible areas are blasted and I can drag it into the spray booth and get some paint down. Well, not quite. After much not so successful research, I found out that I need to clean this freshly blasted metal one way or another. There were countless suggestions in the forums dating back from 2008 up to 2022. And the general consensus in recent years is to wash the metal down with water and dawn as the Americans say, or ferry washing up liquid as we say here in the UK, because apparently that strips off all of the residue from blasting and any other contaminants that might compromise the coating. Another more recent method for prepping blasted metal for epoxy primer specifically is to 80 grit it with an orbital sander where you can, and scotch bright the bits where you can't. This is also said to lift the residue which can then be blown off with an air gun. 
I'm going to go for a mixture of both, but like a few people on the forums, I'm a bit worried about flash rusting. So I'm going to go easy on the water and make sure it's absolutely clean and dry before I paint. There were a few spots of primer and rust left over, which I got with the palm sander, but in hindsight I think this was a waste of time. Because I can't blast, clean and paint the whole chassis in one go, I'm going to have to do this in stages. The blasted area needs to be sealed within the same day to prevent any flash rusting from forming. As much work as it's going to be, I'm going to do the engine bay first, then for example blast the inside of the car again, clean it down thoroughly and then paint it. Then I'll do the same for the boot and so on. I should have put some proper gloves on because the amount of times I cut my fingers and hands was just silly. Don't worry, I removed all of the blood afterwards to ensure maximum coating adhesion. So with all of the bits I can DA, DA'd, I grabbed a roll of scotch brite and rubbed down every single inch of the engine bay. I then carefully washed the car down, wiped it and air dried it. So this is the paint I've gone for, a 2 pack anti-corrosion epoxy primer from Novol. A primer specifically for car chassis and one that is designed to be painted over with 2k paint. This is the type of paint I should have gone for right after the car was blasted the first time. I've never seen a hardener like that in paint before. That must be a good thing, right? The problem is, the whole car would have needed to be prepped for it, and they didn't really offer that service. Which is probably why it's best to go to a proper car chassis blasting place that knows about all these nuances. Even at the correct ratios, this paint is super thick and requires a 1.8mm nozzle to spray. I have a 1.4 to 1.8mm, so this might be a bit of a squeeze, but I can always reduce the spray pattern to put more paint down at once. And with all of that in mind, I got started on painting the engine bay. It's actually a joy to spray over freshly blasted metal knowing it will have a lasting effect on the car, and it looks great too. That was until I realised I didn't clean it well enough. After the first coat, I saw some imperfections in the paint, so instead of giving up and leaving in a strop, I finger sanded every single imperfection until the engine bay was smooth. I then cleaned the entire car from top to bottom, and then went over with a rag and some thinners. I then filled the gun up for a second time and tried again. This time everything went as it was supposed to, two good wet coats with a glossy finish, and most importantly of all, no grit under the paint. Thankfully I learned my lesson early on this one and didn't go crazy just painting the whole thing. I did get a bit carried away after climbing into the engine bay and painted myself in. I had to slide along the floor to get out without ruining the paint. All part of the fun. And there we go, the engine bay is rust free and properly protected from the elements. This is now left to dry for a full 24 hours at which point I can move on to the other areas of the car and in time have it all sealed up and ready for the welding stage. Moving on to tougher decisions and sadder times, after a few months of trying I couldn't find any rear quarters whatsoever, but even if I found them I probably wouldn't want to pay the asking price. So instead this car is getting the chop. It was my plan to save it, but after much deliberation I think it would be a huge project that will require almost a full parts list to get it back to completion as well as all of the welding and so on. The loom has been mostly stripped, there's rust all over the place, even on the quarters that I want, there's rust. The seats are so rusty, they won't slide out of the way so I can get to the bolts that hold them in place. The dash is cracked, the carpet is mouldy, the rear bumper has rotted away, the tail panel has been crushed, somehow, the front windscreen is cracked and the list goes on and on. I think if I strip it down fully and use it as a donor car, I think I'll get a lot more use out of it than the scrapyard would have. Things like the boot lid and the rear glass can be sold on to help others with their restoration, so it's not all bad. You can definitely tell I feel bad about this as I'm just trying to justify my actions.
This rear beige houndstooth backbench isn't damaged at all, it's just very mouldy. I think with a deep clean this might just come up alright. I made sure to carefully remove and store all of the bits that were worth keeping as you never know when you or someone else might need them. With everything out of the way I can now mark the lines where we're going to cut as well as all of the spot welds that need to be removed. As I said before there's a little bit of damage that needs to be sorted on both of the arches but it's nothing in comparison to the old ones which have been repaired multiple times and not with the best of repairs at that. This arch repair actually sticks out considerably more than the other side which hasn't been done it's quite funny to think I didn't notice this when the car was complete, but it's clearly had a bit of a wide arch on one corner the whole time I've owned it. With the markings made and the surrounding parts mostly off, it was time to start splitting the panel from the main chassis without damaging the panel. Thankfully I had help from my mate Ed, who's done this kind of thing before on his E36 M3. Big thanks to Ed for helping out, really couldn't have done this without you. For the straight cuts, we went a little further than needed so we can finish them off away from the car and on a workbench, which will also make it a lot easier to remove some of the spot welds. The finger sander made this job so much easier than it would have been had I just drilled them out. It's so easy to drill through both pieces of metal, whereas with the finger sander you can clearly see when you make it through to the panel you want to keep. Some of you are going to hate this, but I found a small wood chisel that was really good at starting the separation of two panels. Then the finger sander and a panel splitter would finish it off. Whilst I was splitting the B and C pillars as well as around the bottom of the window, Ed was making the cuts to free the panel from the inside and around the bottom. Finally two cuts on the pillars free the quarter and once the sunroof drain pipe let go, it was free. As much as this pains me, I think it had to be done and it was no coincidence that this chassis just landed at my feet when it did. It'll be missed, but never forgotten, Bravey 30. Anyway, that's about it for this episode. We've still got another quarter to take from the donor and endless episodes on the main project now it's back. Well, I hope it does end one day, but we can all see the amount of work required here, and with my track record, we should be done in around the year 2074. So uh, stay tuned for that. Also stay tuned for the Mercedes rebuild coming very soon, which I'm looking forward to, and then it's E30 all the way. I'm sure some of you are just as glad as I am to see the E30 back on the channel, and I think this is definitely the start of more consistent episodes from me. Thanks ever so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Cheers.